Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, because I stopped in the middle of things last time, let me just give a quick, quick review of where we got to. So we had a, a mirror pair U and V of log Calabi Yau varieties, and we discussed the Strominger Yau Zaslo conjecture that says when you have a mirror pair, a way to think about it geometrically is there should be a, a pair of dual torus vibrations, a Lagrangian torus vibrations like this. So over the same base, U maps to be uh, via F, V maps to be via G. The fibers are, um, the smooth fibers are, are real N tori, S1 to the N. <laughs> and they're dual in, in the sort of obvious sense. So if I write a torus without choosing coordinates, I can write it as H1 LZ tensor S1. And the dual torus just obtained by dualizing this abelian group H1 of L. <coughs> okay, so that's the Strom and Zaslow conjecture. Uh, related to that is uh, the homological mirror symmetry conjecture of Kinsevich, which says in this context, if you just look at the uh, symplectic geometry of U, there's a category you can associate to it called the Fukaya category. And this uh, category should be equivalent um, to the derived category of coherent sheaves on V. So we're regarding now U just as a symplectic manifold and V as a complex manifold. <coughs> so what I explained last time is that um, this is compatible with the SYZ conjecture in the following way. It's expected that if you just take a point in V and you take the skyscraper sheaf, that corresponds to uh, a fiber of the SYZ vibration on the mirror, the fiber corresponding to the point P. So just take... So P lies in some fiber of V, take the corresponding fiber of U. <coughs> and together with uh, a local system. So the uh, objects of the Fukai category are Lagrangian submanifolds together with the data of a, of a, of a local system on, on the Lagrangian. So that's just uh, the same as a representation of the fundamental group of L into, into the group. And the group of the local system is just the unitary group U1, or the circle. So this... This element is nothing other than an element of the dual torus. So it's just the same group as we had over here, thinly disguised. <coughs> and those should correspond under this identification. So that should actually correspond to the choice of the point P. <coughs> but the moral of all this is that somehow, you know, how does one construct V if you're just given U and you want to construct the mirror and you try to do it using the homological mirror symmetry conjecture? What you say is there's some uh, objects in the Fukai category of U, namely these. Lagrangian tori with, with an arbitrary U1 local system, just take the moduli space of those objects. That would correspond under mirror symmetry just, just the moduli space of skyscraper sheaves on V, which of course is V itself. So that gives you a construction of the mirror at a uh, conceptual level. <clears throat> and so somehow this is this point of view will sort of motivate now how we try to describe this um, mirror variety V explicitly. <coughs> Okay, so first of all, what I want to do is discuss the complex structure on V. So at the moment, I've said, okay, as a set, I've told you what it is. But, um, you know, it's supposed to be a complex manifold. So how do we construct the complex structure? And this is going to be two versions. So there's, the first version is the naive version. And the second one will incorporate what are called instanton corrections. Um, so I'll say more about what that, what that means um, after the first step. But maybe I'll just say immediately that somehow this is where all the deep properties of mirror symmetry are sort of hidden. So for instance, if you are familiar with the fact that gromov witten invariants on one side correspond to some periods on the, others, on the other side, this is really coming out of this second step, but how you modify the complex structure of V um, according to certain counts of um, holomorphic curves. <clears throat> okay, but let's, let's do the naive version first. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, draw the following picture. So this is a picture of the torus vibration on U. Uh, I want to describe local coordinates on this, um, this uh, set V, the moduli space of these fibers of U together with U1 local system. So let's pick a reference fiber over B0. 
and take another point close by. <coughs> so let's draw the corresponding fibers, L0 and LB. <coughs> so I'm going to describe some complex coordinates. which I'm thinking of as the set of these various fibers together with local systems. <clears throat> okay, so what do I do? So just for any one cycle in the reference fiber, <clears throat> I'm going to lift it To a relative element, so I'm going to choose a path from B0 to B. Here's my gamma in the fiber. I'm just going to extend it to um, a two cycle like this. So I'm, I'm working in some small neighborhood of B0, so I can do this um, yeah, in, in a way that sort of you know, doesn't, doesn't depend on. Uh, any choices at the level of, of, of topology. <clears throat> and then um, I'm going to define, so z, z, z to the exponent gamma, that'll be my notation, notation for the associated local coordinate. If I evaluate it at a pair, L rho, <clears throat> I guess it's my L here, <clears throat> what should it be? So it's a, it's a complex number, in fact a non-zero complex number. So it's the exponential, the normalizing factor 2 pi i, and then the integral of uh, the complexified Kähler form. So this is what I discussed last time. So omega is the symplectic form, and b is the so-called b field on, um, on our variety u. So if you want to ignore the b field, feel free. You can set b equals 0. <coughs> so, and we're just going to integrate that over this uh, cycle gamma. And multiply, so the final term, so how does the local system contribute? So it's rho times the boundary of gamma. This is an element of C star. Um, and so, so that's a definition associated to one element of H1, and if I choose a basis, so if gamma 1 up to gamma n is a basis of H1, then we get local coordinates. Z1 up to Zn on V is a complex manifold, <coughs> and the local model these coordinates is just, you take the torus with n, n coordinates z1 up to zn, and the map to b is just given by um, the, uh, <clears throat> so, let's see, so how have I done this? Um, okay, I'm going to take the following coordinates on the base. So I'm just going to take the absolute value and then do the following normalization. Um, so these are my coordinates on the base. And so just unpacking what I've done there, in other words, this is, sorry, I'm just inverting the transformation there. This is the integral over gamma i of omega. So these are um, the coordinates on the base. So we have um, distinguished coordinates on the base given just by the areas of these um, cylinders with respect to um, the uh, symplectic form omega. <coughs> okay. 
And so why did I choose uh, this particular normalization of the coordinates on the base? The point is that these are what are so-called integral affine coordinates. So remark is that the yj are what's called integral affine coordinates. On, on the base B. And what does that mean? So it just means if I have a, you know, I, I cover my manifold by um, patches of this sort, if I change from one chart to another, the transition map lies in the integral affine group. So GLNZ, a semi direct product with RN. But what I mean is, um, you know, what was the um, ambiguity in choosing these coordinates? Well, first of all, I had to pick a basis of uh, H1 of the torus. So that's just an element of GLNZ. And I also had to pick my base point. So if I translated the base point, that would change these areas by a constant. That's the um, translation here. I think it's X. <coughs> Okay, so these are special distinguished coordinates on the base associated to um, the symplectic form on the symplectic manifold and, and the structure of this Lagrangian torus vibration. And so in the theory of integral systems, these are called action angle coordinates. Okay. Okay, so that's the naive complex structure. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, that doesn't quite work. It needs to be corrected. So what's the problem? So this does not extend. So let me go back to the same notation I had yesterday. So what I really have is you know, a, a Lagrangian torus vibration over... Um, an open subset of B. Fibers. And there'll be some subset of singular fibers where this construction um, does not apply. So what I'm really getting, doing is getting uh, complex structure on this open set. So the problem is that this complex structure does not extend uh, to a complex structure on, on B. Um, maybe I should be more precise about it. I haven't told you what V is yet, but you know this is some complex manifold. And there's no way to extend it to any sort of reasonable complex analytic space. So, you know, if you try to um, do that, you'll just find there aren't enough functions to make this a proper space. So, because, why is that? Because of the monodromy. Around the singular fibers. So the point being, if I go around a singular fiber, these sort of coordinates I've written down will undergo some non-trivial transformation, and it means that you, know, you won't be able to extend that to a, a local function near, near the singularity. <coughs> okay, so what's the solution? And again, this was in the, the original paper of Strominger, Yao, and Zaslow, and was motivated by considerations in string theory. So what you should do is modify the gluing of these local charts um, in the following way. So using counts of holomorphic disks. Holomorphic disks ending on the fibers of the XYZ vibration. So the picture is, you know, I've got my SYZ fiber, and I've got some holomorphic disk whose boundary lies on that SYZ fiber. Um, 
And a sort of typical picture is, uh, you know, how does this disk arise? So somehow is a good picture. If you have a singular fiber like this, a pinched torus, uh, such that this cycle is the vanishing cycle for this degeneration, then at least topologically you can see there is a disk like this. And in certain situations, um, that disk can be made to be, ho can, can be, can be come holomorphic for appropriate choice of a particular disk. <coughs> okay, so um, let's see an example. So I want to go back to the example we discussed yesterday. So if you remember, yesterday I had a construction um, of the following type. So I started with, um, basically started with C2, and I just blew up a single point on the boundary, let's say, uh, one zero, for instance. And I'm thinking about my log club yeah, as being the complement of the boundary. So, you know, so my u, so this is my xd, u is x minus t. So, so d being the, the strict transform of the boundary. <coughs> okay. And so what I said last time is that if you think about this from the point of view of the SYZ vibration, you get a picture like this um, for the torus vibration. So, XYZ vibration. A bit difficult to draw, but let me try. So, first of all, the base, like this, so, like a quadrant, and there's a, a singularity. Yeah, so, the monodromy of the cycles in H1L around this point, given by this matrix. <coughs> and so, you know, so the picture, so this is the base, and here's U. So over this point, there's a singular fiber. And if I sort of look at this path here, that's, um, uh, roughly speaking, so over some path of this sort, I see the exceptional divisor. This, this line here corresponds to my boundary, one of my boundary divisors. Then the other boundary divisor I guess I don't care about. <coughs> this is um, the x-axis. So that's, that's the rough picture. <coughs> so e is my exceptional curve. Okay, and so now uh, one can see uh, that there are two disks in this picture which end on the fibers of the SYZ vibration. So maybe... Um... Oh, sorry, so this is what I did last time. So if you remember, we had just the moment map image of C2, just the positive quadrant in R2. We removed... Um, a small triangle, and then we glued via this map um, to form this space B. <clears throat> Does this sound familiar? <laughs> okay. So I want to emphasize that you know this is a um, is this this should not be thought of as embedded in the blackboard. It's some kind of you know. So th this this is a planar picture, and now I've done some funny gluing. So it's really you know think of it more as an abstract space as opposed to. Okay. So what I want to sort of explain is there are two disks in this picture. So let's sort of see. So where are they? If you take this line, so this is the line uh, I guess x equals one, and you take its strict transform. So now let's sort of um, fatten this up to a, to, a, to a more reasonable picture of the sort that a complex geometer might draw. So here's 
here's a, so this is, um, right, what, what does this look like? It looks like a, uh, a disk. <coughs> so C, CP1 with one point removed. So here's a disk coming out of the singularity of the singular fiber here. And similarly, um, you know, here's my CP1. And you know, this is the other disk, so coming out that way. So there are two disks um, emanating from the singular point, one going this way, one going the other way. Uh, and so when I say two disks, uh, what I mean is um, two families of disks. So depending on which fiber I want it to end on, you know, I stop at a different point. <coughs> so this is the singular fiber. This is a general fiber over this um, over a wall in the base. So what we have is this kind of picture. There's a wall. Um, real co-dimension one over which there do exist holomorphic disks ending on the fiber. So there exist disks, exactly, exactly one, ending on the fiber over the wall. Again, this is a picture of B again. So there's a singularity here, and the disks are emanating in the two directions from the singularity. OK, so now I want to try to show how do we correct this problem with the local coordinates. So now I'm going to introduce a branch cut. Branch cut. So that on the complement of this cut, uh, in, in, the, in the variety U, I can define these uh, functions uh, Z1 and Z2 globally away from the cut. So define coordinates. Um, Z1, Z2, um, away uh, over the complement of the cut. <coughs> okay. And um, so, um, first of all, let me just say, what's the monodromy? So remember, these are associated to um, the homology of um, the torus. These correspond to a basis, gamma 1, gamma 2 of L. So what's the monodromy as I go around this point? So you have to be a little bit careful. So go back to um, so what we did last time. So this has monodromy. This gives you the monodromy on the integral tangent vectors. So this is the dual space. These correspond to coordinates. So this is cotangent vectors. So that's dual to the tangent space um, at a point. So I'll, I'll write TZ for integral tangent space. So this was the monodromy on the tangent space. So the monodromy here, so in the opposite direction, will just be given by the transpose. So if we take our z1, z2 to correspond to the two basis vectors, or the dual basis of the basis there, <coughs> this is the monodromy. So it's saying that z1 goes to z1, and z2 goes to z1 inverse z2. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do the transpose. <laughs> I should have written it down, so this is the transpose. <laughs> okay, now we're good. So Z1 goes to Z1, Z2 inverse, and Z2 goes to Z2. Sorry, I, I, I should say, so this is, of course, um, the monodromy written additively, and here we're writing it multiplicatively. So the map Z gamma goes to Z gamma is a homomorphism. So, so this is just writing um, H1 of L multiplicatively. <coughs> Okay, so that's, that's the transformation across here. And so what do we attach to the wall? So, so as I said, on this wall, we're going to associate an automorphism to crossing this wall. So what is it? It's just the standard cluster transformation that we've seen already. So on this side, it's given by the following formula. So Z1 is fixed, and Z2 goes to Z2 times 1 plus Z1 inverse. And above the wall... 
uh, above the uh, singular point. So on the other connected component of the wall, I'm running out of space. Maybe I'll erase this matrix if you don't mind. Uh, so Z1, Z2, similar formula, but now it's 1 plus Z1. And um, let me try to explain. So wh where did these uh, functions here, so we think of those two functions as attached to the wall, 1 plus Z1 and 1 plus Z1 inverse. Where did those functions come from? They're basically just recording the class of this disk. So, um, you know, so this is some holomorphic disk. You can look at the boundary of the disk that has a class in H1, and under our normalizations, that corresponds to the coordinate Z1. Similarly here, you know, this disk has the opposite boundary um, as an oriented uh, you know, disk, and that corresponds to Z1 inverse. <coughs> okay. And so you can now check, you just see, that now the um, gluing is consistent. Meaning if I go around a loop, then this Composition is the identity. So that's the um, simplest example of this fixing the problem with monodromy using holomorphic disks. And in general, you know, this is kind of an amazing thing that sort of came out of string theory. <coughs> um, I should say, I'll give, you know, later in a, in a moment, I'll give a sort of more mathematical reason why should this work. <coughs> So why does this work if you just correct using holomorphic disks? <clears throat> but let me just say now, in general, what happens. So holomorphic disks in U ending on the eight fibers um, So these lie over real co-dimension one walls in the base. Possibly thickened, so it's not. Uh, in some limit, they, they become real co-dimension one, but uh, they might be sort of slightly thicker. There might be some kind of amoeba-like structure transverse to the wall. <coughs> and what's the we attach a function? To the wall. So here, alpha is the class of the disk. Um, so let me just say, so now I'm sort of writing a slightly more general notation, so let's write it down. So what's z, z to the alpha? <clears throat> it's really the same definition as before, but now I have a global homology class to integrate over. <clears throat> uh, times the holonomy. I'm sorry, what did I call it? Rho, rho of delta alpha. So in terms of what I did before, this is just a constant times z to the delta alpha, the boundary of alpha. So you know, the original coordinates were in terms of h1l. Now I've got an actual class in a relative class so that maps to h1l just by taking the boundary. But uh, here I'm getting a, uh, a function which takes account of the, the, the area of this, of this disk. Okay, and now this function is some kind of generating function. Counting uh, multiple covers of the disk. Uh, the disk's associated with the wall. Multiple covers. <coughs> okay, and... Um, <coughs> What's the uh, gluing automorphism? So it can be written in these coordinates z gamma in the following way. The 
they just take the product with this generating function raised to a power. So you take the boundary of gamma, and then there's a class, let me call it C. So this, uh, maybe C, C sub, uh, C sub, let's call it C. So what's C? So this is a, a class in H, N minus one of the fiber. And it's just the, um, swept out by the boundary of the disks. And so if we're in dimension two, this would just be delta alpha itself, the boundary. <laughs> okay, so this looks like a crazy thing to do, so let me try to explain why this is gonna work. Why? Why does this work? Reasonable question. So the point is that with the corrected gluing, uh, we can write down global functions. global holomorphic functions on V in the following way. Of course, now I'm really in the non-compact case that we're most interested in, otherwise there won't be any global holomorphic functions at all. <coughs> but yes, yeah, so we're really thinking about the log, log Calabi out case now. So what do I do? So let's take some compactification. Let's let C be some a component of the boundary in some uh, log Calabi out compactification. As I call it, usually V is inside. Um, so, yeah, I think it's Y, uh, Y E, right? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong side. U is X set minus D. So just the usual picture, I've got my U and I compactify it to some projective variety X with a normal crossing boundary at infinity and just take some component of the boundary. And I'll take a positive integer as well. Then what's my function? So incidentally, uh, we call these uh, theta functions because um, you know, the analogous construction for an abelian variety produces the usual uh, theta functions from classical geometry. <clears throat> so again, it's the same, a similar formula to before. So if I have a point in V, so it's given by a Lagrangian and a local system, <clears throat> I take a sum of the following sort. <clears throat> so it will be a sum over classes in the relative Uh, the relative um, homology group, H2XL, of a count of disks, N beta, times this um, local function, Z to the beta, defined in the same way as over here, so this is just the, the definition of Z to the beta. And what's N beta? So where N beta is the number of holomorphic disks So I'll use this blackboard bold D for the, the usual complex disk, for radius one, closed disk in the plane. So mapping to the pair XL, so a holomorphic disk in X now, the compact guy, with boundary on the Lagrangian, with the following properties, so it's in class beta, it has a relative homology class, that's this beta here, um, such that, so several things. So first of all, it meets C in a single point um, with uh, multiplicity, so contact order M. 
the local intersection number is this positive integer m. <clears throat> Secondly, um, it's disjoint from the rest of the boundary. So it doesn't intersect the boundary anywhere else. And finally, uh, one more condition which fixes the expected dimension to zero is that it passes through a general point of L. So remember, the boundary lies on L. I want it to pass through a particular point of that Lagrangian. So then that's expected dimension zero. <clears throat> okay, and so the point is that if you try to do these counts, um, and you know, use the naive gluing of these, so you don't make any of these corrections, this function will jump um, as you cross a wall. And the gluing correction is um, defined in such a way that, that, that it corrects for that jump, so that these become global holomorphic functions on V. Um, so let's give an example. So back to our, our running example. So again, I'll sort of draw the base. Um, and here's our wall, remember? There are these two disks emanating from the wall. Um, and so if I try to, let's, let's make this our boundary divisor C. If I try to do this computation on one side of the wall over here, I'll just get a single disk. So I'll sort of draw it like this, sort of, it's just, um, think about it, you know, it's just one of the lines, y equals constant. That's your disk. If you're on the other side of the wall, you have that, you have that disk again, you know, the same thing. Another disk, y equals constant. But there's another one as well, looks like this. So I'll sort of draw it like an amoeba, that's what it looked like under this projection. Some kind of amoeba like this. There's another disk of this sort. <clears throat> and again, let me sort of try to sort of uh, say intuitively what you should think. You take the original disk we had, there's a disk coming out along the wall. So to glue those disks together, together with a cylinder. So here there'll be some kind of balancing condition. Is that the sum of the boundaries zero H1L. And just, so you could imagine you, you glue together some topological surface like that, but then the assertion is, okay, near to that topological surface, there's an actual holomorphic disk. <clears throat> and since we're in such a simple example, you can actually write down this disk explicitly. So let's go back to the toric variety. So remember that this was, uh, you know, originally we had the toric variety of just blowing up a point. I guess I'm sort of slightly abusing notation here. But, yeah, I was originally talking about the base, but there's also, of course, the, the variety living over it. So we, blow, we, we blew up a point. Let's construct, where, what would this disk look like down here? So it would just be a disk like this. There's a disk intersecting the boundary in two points, and it's ending, so this is our fiber here, ending on a Lagrangian torus fiber L. And the way that we constructed this Lagrangian vibration, I didn't give you all the details last time, but away from this wall, the Lagrangian vibration is just the same in, away from some, some um, compact neighborhood of the, of the wall. So in fact, this will just be the usual usual torus fiber um, for a toric variety, just, you know, the, the absolute value of the, co the coordinates is constant. And so then, uh, you know, my disk would be the following disk. So remember, this is the point, what did I call it, one zero. Um, so what's the disk? So one way to write it down like this.
Yeah, so that's a, a disk which goes through this point one zero, and if you look at the boundary of the disk, this is D mapping to uh, C2, um, you'll check that the way I've, I've cooked things up so that the boundary of the disk maps exactly to this um, Lagrangian torus fiber. And so really the only thing that's going into this, which probably most people know, is this uh, thing from complex analysis 101, uh, you know, so-called Blaschke factor. So, so what we're saying is this map. Uh, gives a map from the unit disk to itself, um, which sends alpha to zero. And in fact, you only, if, you, if you only know this one fact, you can basically completely classify holomorphic disks in toric varieties ending on a, on a, on a, on a Lagrangian torus fiber. <coughs> so that was done in a paper of Cho and O. <coughs> Let me just give the reference. So, you know, I'm just giving this reference if, in case you want to see more, but I, I, I guarantee you, if you don't see it immediately, you can do this example on your own and see that this is, this is, the, this is a, such a disk. <coughs> okay. Um, so, I want to uh, switch gears now. And so, before I do, are there any questions at this point? So maybe I just quickly review what we said. So the point is that you know, a mathematician can understand why this gluing is the right thing because what it does is it makes sure that the complex manifold you're constructing has lots of global functions. Right? So somehow if I want to extend a complex manifold, you know, have, have some say structure on a, on a complement of some small co-dimension set on a complex manifold and I want to know if it extends to a complex variety over that puncture, then you know, one way to do that is just ensure that you have enough functions to define uh, the thing. Um, you know, so you can take sort of spec of the ring of global functions, essentially, just to extend it. <coughs> and so this construction sort of explains, from a mathematical point of view, why this instant on correction will solve this problem that the uh, complex structure doesn't extend over, over the discriminant locus. <coughs> okay, but now I want to... Um, ex explain. So, you know, our work is um, basically taking this picture and trying to make it a rigorous mathematical uh, proof of this conjecture for cluster algebras. So, a construction of global functions on cluster algebras. <coughs> so, so, the next step is to translate this picture into algebraic geometry. Or, really, more accurately, tropical geometry, and use it to prove, uh, to construct a canonical basis of cluster algebras. So remember, what is a cluster algebra? Well, We've got some log Calabi our variety with some additional special properties. We just take its global functions. That's the cluster algebra. And so, you know, this canonical basis will be exactly this, uh, this basis described here. So, in fact, if you do this for all possible components and all possible positive integers um, m, and you throw in the identity element, that would be called theta zero, these guys together form a basis of the um, ring of global functions. <clears throat> okay, but that's going to require quite a bit of work, so let me switch gears and, and start doing that. <clears throat> so let's quickly re review the notation that we um, used earlier. 
So we have a cluster variety. <coughs> and we've got some toric model. So in the cluster language, that's what's called a seed. <coughs> we've got the torus. T, that's the interior of this toric pair. That's a copy of C star to the N. We've got the lattices, so N is the lattice of one parameter subgroups or the first homology of the torus. Um, that's a copy of Z to the N. N is the dual of M. We have a holomorphic symplectic form on X. Or strictly speaking on U with log poles along the boundary. And what we sort of explained last time is, um, in, in, on the first day, is that actually that becomes a completely combinatorial thing if you just restrict it to the torus. Um, let's call that sigma bar. So that's a log two form on holomorphic two form on the torus. And uh, that's a very simple thing. It's just uh, got constant coefficients. given by some skew matrix. And without choosing coordinates, that's an element of wedge two of M tensor C. <clears throat> so what was the story? So this toric, uh, I probably shouldn't write any lower, should I? Let me go over here. <laughs> So this uh, blow-up was a blow-up of a certain amount of data. So it's defined by the following data. So we had some centers, zi. They were given by a boundary divisor. Let's, let me write d sub vi. So vi will be the generator of the ray corresponding to the boundary divisor, intersected with um, the zero locus of a character. So let me write my character in multiplicative notation, z to the mi equals lambda i. So here, the vi is a primitive element of n. mi is a primitive element of m. Uh, lambda i, of course, is just a scalar. And there was the condition, which was for, if you do this blow up, when does the the holomorphic form actually lift, and the condition uh, was. So in, these, uh, in this combinatorial fashion, you take sigma bar, you evaluate it at vi in the first argument, that should be a multiple of mi. That's just the condition for the holomorphic form sigma bar to lift to a holomorphic form sigma on the blow-up. <coughs> okay. So that's the uh, notation that we had last time. I, I agree it's a bit of a mouthful, so <laughs> my apologies. Um, so now what we want to de define is what's called a scattering diagram. Associated to this data. So um, <coughs> let me first explain what's basically going on here. So we, we understood that in the base of this uh, torus vibration, there were certain walls in the base that we had to attach some automorphism to. <clears throat> now, one can certainly ask, what happens when, one, when two of those walls collide? <clears throat> well, uh, if you were to go around a loop here, so there'll be some automorphism attached to each wall, you know, this, this um, composition of automorphisms will be some kind of commutator. So it wouldn't be the identity unless these two guys commute. And there's no reason to expect that in general. So what one can think of is that the scattering diagram um, is, there's a canonical way to fix this. So if you have these 
two walls, I'll draw some arrows to indicate the direction in which the sort of disks propagate. So somehow this is the, the direction in which the disks area increases. So then what happens is it's going to be some kind of picture like this, where you add a whole new bunch of rays coming out of this point, <coughs> um, which fix this property that theta should be the identity when you go around a loop. And again, topologically, it's the same picture we saw before, that if I have two incoming disks, I can sort of glue them on to a cylinder like this, at least topologically, take you know, n times this, m times this, glue them together and get some nearby holomorphic disk. That's the meaning of these rays. <clears throat> so basically, uh, yeah, what the statement will be is that somehow, if you take the initial disks coming from the blow-ups, and you apply this scattering procedure, that will somehow tell you all the holomorphic disks on your, on your manifold, and, and thus you'll be able to build the mirror um, using this scattering diagram. But the first step, the, 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 the technology of the scattering diagram, is to just start with this data which tells you these initial uh, disks corresponding to the blow-ups. How does that data determine all the other disks? That's what's encoded in this scattering diagram. I should say, um, you know, this was discovered uh, by Konsevich and Soibelman in 2004, and it's still a kind of a miraculous object. We don't quite know why it works, but it does, and it's very beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so let's try to say what it is. So first of all, uh, I'll have a base ring. I'm just going to write down a polynomial ring. These are just formal parameters which are going to control convergence issues. Let's write M for the maximal ideal of the origin. <clears throat> and we'll use hats for M addict completion. There'll be a certain amount of um, care required to, to, to get convergence. So what's the scattering diagram? Well, it's a collection of walls. So I'll use the notation D and F. So D will be the support of the wall. So this will be um, a rational polyhedral cone. in the vector space associated to the lattice N. That's the uh, lattice of one parameter subgroups of the torus where the, where the fan for a toric variety lives. And it's got co-dimension one. <coughs> okay, so given that, so let N in the dual lattice be a primitive vector uh, with um, delta contained in m per. So that's just determined up to a sign, just the hyperplane that this rational polyhedral cone lies in. <coughs> um, so then we also have another part of the data. So what's this function f? First of all, I have a vector v. In the, in the lattice N. So this is going to be called, this is related to what's called the direction of the wall. <coughs> Again, primitive. We have our usual condition on the uh, relation between these two guys. So if I take sigma bar of V, and that should be a multiple of M. The same condition we had over here. And our f is now a function. So we've got this, we've got this coefficient ring A. So we just take the polynomial ring in this variable z to the v. And that lives inside um, The, this uh, ring here, maybe I should just say, so what's this? This is just the coordinate ring 
of the torus, the dual torus actually, so T dual uh, cross um, A AR with coordinates T1 up to TR. So these are just global functions on the dual torus, um, but we've uh, introduced these formal parameters, T1 up to TR. <coughs> and um, I'm going to have to complete here, so this won't actually be an element of this ring, it'll be an element of the completion, so let's put hats. So what's, sorry, I should have said, so T dual, it's the obvious thing, of course, my T is N tends to C star, so T dual will be N dual tends to C star, or M tends to C star. So, it's always confusing. <laughs> I, I've been doing this for a long time and I still get confused. So, N is the one parameter subgroups of T, but it's the char characters on T dual. So, this Z to the V is a character on, on the dual torus. That's our patch of the um, mirror variety. <coughs> okay. And so, this uh, guy should satisfy some property. So, it should be congruent to one modulo the maximal ideal and also its constant term should be one, so it'll be, um, so it's a, in this polynomial ring, it's a common to one mod the maximal ideal, and this, the constant term is also equal to one. <coughs> we have a finiteness condition. Sorry? I just can't hear you. Uh, M times this, actually. Yeah. So every term will have a non-trivial, um, you know, <laughs> exactly what I said. This is correct. Um, so the finiteness condition, so for every positive integer L, there are only finitely many Uh, F congruent, uh, not congruent to one mod M to the L. Okay. And so, so okay, this is a whole load of, load of junk. What's the uh, point here? So I've got a wall crossing automorphism. Associated to a wall. So here's my wall for a two-dimensional picture. Here's m greater than zero, m less than zero. If I cross this wall in that direction, so from m greater than zero to m less than zero, I get an automorphism of the ring roughly speaking an automorphism of the torus, the dual torus. What does it send? So it sends z to u z to the exponent u goes to z to the u times some power of f. And the power is given in this way. Let's take the pairing between u and m. <coughs> so this is, again, should look familiar. It's something like what we were just doing in the symplectic discussion translated into this framework. No, so, um, sorry, finitely many walls, such that. So what it means is that, I mean, sorry, let's say it in terms of this. So attached to each wall is an automorphism. But at any finite order, I only want to have finitely many non-trivial automorphisms. Right? That's, the, that's what it means. <coughs> so now what you get, so now for any path, in the scattering diagram, so the ambient space is NR. Um, so I don't want it to go through the singularities of D, the, the, the places where it's not a manifold with endpoints 
Again, I don't want endpoints on a wall. Maybe I should write you know, vertical lines for the support of these things. <coughs> we'll get an automorphism. In the obvious way, you just compose all the automorphisms you get by crossing the various walls. And, you know, if you sort of, this is why this sort of completion is kind of uh, crucial. Remember, all that means is completion, you know, r hat. I'm just taking the inverse limit like this. So what I can do, at any finite level, this makes sense, because there's only finitely many walls. And then I pass to the inverse limit, I get this, this uh, automorphism, which in general could be kind of gnarly. <coughs> okay. Um, let, me, let me go in for one minute, because I just want to state the theorem <laughs> of Kansevich, Soivman, and gross Siebert. Theorem. David Soivman, Gross Siebert. So did this in dimension two um, in a slightly different context, and Gross and Siebert um, translated it into algebraic geometry and did it in arbitrary dimension. <coughs> so if I take, let's call it D in, this is an initial scattering diagram. consisting only of hyperplanes. So each wall, the, the support is a hyperplane. Um, uh, then there's a unique scattering diagram D containing this initial scattering diagram with two properties, so such that, so first of all, uh, the new walls are all outgoing. And secondly, we have this consistency property that theta d gamma is the identity for every loop gamma. And it occurs to me, I forgot to tell you what an outgoing wall is, so let me do that now very quickly. Uh, so in this data, luckily I haven't, uh, no, I have erased it. Um, oh, sorry, here it is. Uh, that's right. So this vector V, so what's an outgoing wall? So the direction of a wall, DF, with the same notation as before, is minus this vector V. And again, informally, this is the, the direction that the disk propagates. So it's the direction in which the area of the disk increases. And we say it's incoming if this vector v is in the wall and outgoing otherwise. Okay, so, so the, um, again, the heuristic here is that we're constructing this variety as a blow-up. We'll have some disks coming from the exceptional divisors, which are going to be the incoming walls. And then we'll have a whole bunch of other disks, which are sort of generated by this process, which will be the outgoing walls. And so this theorem tells you that somehow there's this sort of magical uh, construction. Um, and it basically just amounts to a, a computation in some... Uh, Lie algebra are associated to this uh, group of scattering automorphisms, uh, which tells you that, you know, given any initial data, you can construct uh, a, a unique scattering diagram with this consistency property. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, I'd, I'd wanted to talk about some examples, but uh, I, I better stop. So, uh, actually, um, Lofa, am I supposed to talk this afternoon as well? There's some sort of exercise session or... I just thought, well, 
Yeah, well, what I wanted to do was to discuss, discuss some examples of this, and so, which might, that might be appropriate to do it this afternoon. I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>